Hello, and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. I am your host, John Henry Sheridan, and uh, I'm excited to say that I have my friend and collaborator, Hannah Rotsivi, with us today. How are you doing, Hannah? Fine, thanks, John. Thanks. I'm trying to find all the buttons that make the, the, uh, this interview work. <laughs> well, well you're, doing, you're doing good so far. Okay. We're here. For here, that's the main thing. So um, uh, I like to start off the show sometimes just to let people know how uh, how I met you, uh, how I met the guests, and say that's you. And uh, um, from my memory, I remember getting a, uh, and it's it's always interesting. My memory of how I met someone and someone else's memory of how we met will always be a little different, right? But um, but anyway, I remember. I graduated Brooklyn College in 2003, and then I got someone from the music conservatory calling me up and saying that, are you interested in being put in contact with someone about a composing job, something like that. Does that sound about right to you? What's your memory of it? Yeah, somebody in the writers group I was in for a number of years out in Rockaway, uh, she sang with somebody in a, in a chorus who was connected to somebody at Brooklyn College. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and through that, I, I don't know if it was the head of the music department. I don't, I don't remember who the connection was, but that too put me in touch with you. Cool. It was very interesting. It was interesting. It, the background they described about you. They said, <laughs> he, he thought you were right for the job, right for it. Mm -hmm. A heavy metal band leader, right? <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> this is not a heavy metal project. And you also did some, mm -hmm. I think, uh, choral work in a, in a church. So you had two sides of you right away, very opposite, you know. So it was mm -hmm. interesting. To, I, I figured, let's, let's see which, where this goes. Yeah, that was that, and I thought that was pretty bold of you to just be willing to give it a shot, you know, and, uh, but I'm glad you did, you know, you were just acting on what I would say is the theme of our show today. Uh, life is creative expression. You were just seeking another outlet of your already very creative life, um, which we'll be getting into. Um, so, uh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for uh, that reminder of how we met from your perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to thank anyone who's watching, uh, please, uh, Thank you everyone for joining. Feel free to leave a message in the chat as we go for Hannah, a question for either of us or uh, just a comment. Uh, we'll be glad to have you. And if you're watching on the replay, thank you as well. So Hannah, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Anything you'd like to share? Where did you grow up? Where do you live now? Okay, well, I'm a Brooklyn girl. Um, I lived here until... Um, I moved to New York uh, with my husband at that time, uh, to Manhattan. We always called it New York. I think things have changed a little bit. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> and I lived in Manhattan for quite a number of years. And then I, was, I, I had wanted to act, but I also, in, in pursuing that, I also studied mime and singing. So that was interesting. I always loved music. Even as a young child, my father and mother finally bought me a little uh, 45 RPM machine. And I had these little CDs. That, well, they weren't CDs at the time. 45 RPMs. And I would listen to them avidly. Um, mm. It was a time in the beginning of rock and roll. But I also liked classical music because my father liked classical music. So he kind of passed that love down to me because he would play certain things and I would be exposed to them you know, pretty much continuously. Um, anyway, um, so I started studying theater seriously when I was in Manhattan and mm. several different aspects of it. And um, I acted um, and I acted and I acted and I acted. And then a um, Fulbright scholarship was offered uh, in Mime in France. Now that was tempting. <laughs> so... A lot of things that I've done have come to me um, on a second wave. I don't get the first wave. I don't catch the first wave, but I catch the second wave, which is so amazing. Um, so I applied, and um, 
I did a project uh, in mine, riding a bicycle, a make-believe bicycle, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, the first prize winner turned it down. I was offered it, therefore. Wow. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's go to Paris. Wow. So I did that. And I stayed in France three years. Um, the first two years in Paris and then another year in the south of France, in the Midi. Uh, and while I, oh, I forgot, forgot to say that I studied acting for two years before I left. And that was with Wynne Hanman, who was the founder of the American Place Theater. Um, I'm not sure if Wynne is still with us, but what a marvelous acting teacher he was. Mm. By not saying very much. Not saying very much at all. <laughs> was wonderful. Uh, so um, I learned in Wynne's class that I could do comedy. Mm. Uh, it, it was an interesting thing because I don't think he had much faith in my acting. And uh, so after the first year, okay, well, she's here. She's in the class, okay. Um, and then the summertime came. We were off from from studying acting. And in the fall, he assigned a scene to me, uh, which I think was uh, with Cliff Gorman, who has passed away. But he's well known from Boys in the Band. Um, and, uh, and when we came back, uh, Wynne said to me, what happened? Because all of a sudden, I could act. And... <laughs> And I find this is also true about me. I need time off. My, my absorption rate is slower. I just need to be away from something, let my subconscious alone, let, let it do its work. Um, oh. Yeah, uh, let's see. So after that, let's see. I came back from France and in the acting field, nobody knew my name anymore. I was, I was away for three years. Mm -hmm. But um, very locally, I was living in the East Village. I found an apartment there, was a circus class on the Bowery. So I said, well, there's going to be, there's going to be comedy. There's going to be comedy there. There's going to be clowns. So I went and I learned how to juggle and still walk and all those things, which I used later in my life to teach. But um, um, I applied to something else. And that was called Ringling Brothers and Barnum Bailey Clown College. And what do you know? I got in. So <laughs> I was off to Florida to, uh, to learn the basics of clowning. Um, and when I came back, um, you know, clowning is very interesting. There are clowns and there are clowns. There are clowns who do it out of the goodness of their hearts to be, you know, uh, do something lovely for children, make them feel better if they're ill, you know. There are Salvation Army clowns, which is a pejorative term, meaning that you, you buy bits and pieces of your costume at a Salvation Army store. And then mm -hmm. there are classic clowns. I was a classic clown. I was a white face, as a matter of fact, they're very much against today's uh, Black Lives Matter. But I was a white face classic clown. Um, they have different categories. The white face classic clown is called either a pretty clown or a... Um, sometimes an imperious clown. Uh, the auguste clown is the one that most of us think of with a sort of com whatever your complexion is, is mostly shining through. And mm -hmm. to give you an example, if you are in a skip, uh, an, uh, a, a classic white face and an auguste, it would be the white face who would give the slap. It's a false slap. You just learn how. Mm -hmm. And the auguste would take the tumble. So okay. that's kind of the relationship. It, it sort of sets up the relationship. Hmm. Um, from there, I clowned for 25 years. I clowned all over the place. I clowned in parties, TV, lots and lots of malls, lots and lots of centers, community centers, Jewish centers, a lot of things, a lot of things. Um, and so I, could it, could it, is it fair to say you clowned around? It's fair. <laughs> <laughs> what else could you say? <laughs> And uh, uh, from there, um, I was becoming a single parent, so I needed to earn a living, and I had my education credits by that time. So I took my test, worked for the Board of Education, was teaching, um, and sort of could not do both, could not perform and also raise a kid and have a full-time job teaching. So um, my son is wonderful, by the way, Jordan C.V., Little plug, uh, playwright. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I was not being creative, and it was very dissatisfying. 
But my wonderful, wonderful, as you know, John, my district arts coordinator, Paul Kaplan, may he rest in peace. He provided the teachers with so many extra things. Most of the teachers didn't go to them because they were tired from teaching. I went to everything. And mm -hmm. I went to um, I went to Young Playwrights, which was the beginning of initiation of my second project. But for my first project, there was a fairy tale workshop at Kingsborough College that Paul sent us to. We had enormous, uh, enormous, uh, like a box of books because the teacher had gotten a grant. And um, there I found the Jack Tales. Now there are many, many Jack in the Jack and the Beanstalk Tales, but I was raising a preteen young man, mm -hmm. and um, and I I latched onto the Jack Tale. I read all of them, and then I reverted to the original, which is the one you and I worked on. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting because it's structure, structure, structure. In musical comedy, it's structure, structure, structure. Sometimes the music is great. Sometimes the lyrics are great. Sometimes they're both great. The book is often lacking, even in some of the best musicals. The book doesn't cohere, mm -hmm. just simply. So um, I should stop talking. But and, wait, and for the sake of the audience, uh, so when you say the book, can you explain that? Because I think people sure. probably think about a book that they read, they read a book. Oh, right. It's a musical comedy uh, term, which means a script. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the actual um, structure of the play, who's the protagonist or the hero or heroine, um, what happens to her or him, what their, what their objectives are, what their wants are, uh, what happens in the path of their journey to getting it or not getting it, mm -hmm. and the end. So mm -hmm. that, that's the book. It's, a, it's very challenging. I'm working on it a lot right now. Not like your book. This is a book <laughs> of musical. Anyway, so... Um, that's when I found you, um, when uh, I had, I wrote Jack because I would write like at 11 o'clock at night after I put, after my son went to bed and I knew I had to be up early in the morning, get him to school, get me to school. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then uh, I was very lucky because I found you. I was very mm -hmm. lucky. And I said, I remember what you said. I said, what did I say to you? I said, well, what do you think you can do? something like that. And you said, whatever it is that you want. You said something <laughs> like that. I said, well, I want a, um, I want an Appalachian uh, kind of <laughs> rock and roll <laughs> score here. Yeah, uh, with rap. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what you did. That is what you, you gave me a great score. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, you definitely were a challenge to me in, in a new way, like a, fr a welcome challenge, like, well, this is cool, but you know, I had to, I didn't know what you always wanted, so I had to, and I can only come from my singer songwriter background. Of course, mixed with the metal, I knew that wasn't generally not really what you wanted. But there was a few songs that were a little bit dark, but um, yeah, and I just had to keep on, you know, throwing things at the wall, and eventually something would stick and say, "Yeah, that's it," and I'd be like, "Okay, I wouldn't have been able to predict it, but that was, you know." So I just had to keep on trying uh, in order to find what you're looking for, but eventually we found it and with each song, pretty much. With each song. And we went back. So Pat, they had a very nice little New York City production. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I think if it was called Jack or Jack the Unbeatable Boy, um, which a, fr a friend of yours, sadly, he's, he's gone, but he photographed it on, he, he um, not photographed, but videoed it on the last day. So mm. we have videos, which is- Yeah, which yeah. will be in the, in the show notes. We'll put in the show notes for people if yeah. they want to see it. Yeah, so it's, it, it was a charming production. We found the, the Looking Glass Theater on West 57th Street, the, um, uh, what was she called? Mil um, uh, literary editor. And she loved it. And she found part of, part of their theater faculty kind of, you know, it wasn't a very big place, so hard to say faculty, but their, their teams was this director, Kate, Kate Fox. Mm -hmm. and she took this play and she made it very, very physical. And she had a lot of connections in terms of who she went to college with and, and, um, and they have lots and lots of pictures and resumes to draw from. So uh, she put that play together and it was, it was great fun. It really was great fun. Yeah. I'm so glad we have the videos. 
Yeah, what a pleasure to uh, go to see that and to see this thing that you and I labored on for quite some time. And uh, all of a sudden it was like, there was life in it and people had, the actors seemed to be having a lot of fun with it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And of course the audience as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm very glad we have those those videos that capture the whole thing, really. They do. They do. Yeah. Actually, I think I even have a, a, possibly I have a video that we haven't seen, but it's on a DAT tape, or we haven't seen in a long time. It might not be as good quality, but it might be like another camera angle somewhere, but I would have to get a DAT machine for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. Um, cool. So there's there was a lot of ground we covered there. Uh, I have to go back to the mining because that, that interests me. Um, when you heard about the mime opportunity in France, uh, you were already miming for a while? Oh, yes. You know, I studied with, um, and I, he, he may have just passed. I started studying at the Circle in the Square Theater with Alvin Epstein. Alvin played the first Lucky in Waiting for Godot. So he, he's very well known in the profession. But then he was uh, either traveling with the show or I'm not sure what his life was like, but his younger brother took over and his younger brother had studied with a great mind master in France, Etienne de Creux, and had also worked with Marcel Marceau, uh, who was um, Etienne de Creux's student who took all the wonderful illusions that Etienne had created. But Etienne looked like a truck driver. Marcel Marceau was classically beautiful mime with a body that reflected somebody who is, uh, could, could show people what the mime was like. And Mark had traveled with Marceau. He was his sign keeper. He held up the signs <laughs> between skits. Mm -hmm. And Mark was very good. Mark uh, was a wonderful teacher. Um, I studied with him. We did major churches and things like that. Oh, because he was, um, Mark was commissioned to do, um, I, actually, I forgive the name of it now, but it was the uh, a mystery play, which is about the Virgin Mary. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, a, a, a musicologist from Columbia University, Yves Tenere, uh hired him to do the mystery of uh, Mary, the Virgin Mary. And I played Mary. So uh, I got to play the Virgin Mary all over New York. Um, uh, what a wonderful thing that was. Wow, was I lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then um, studied with Solomon Yakim, who was an Israeli. Um, and he was, his studio was uptown. And that's when I heard about the Fulbright. I was studying with uh, Solomon. So I had okay. two or three years at least of mine behind me. So what, what, what age were you roughly when, when you heard about the Fulbright? Uh, probably about 23, 24. Oh, okay. So you already finished with college? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I finished. Mm -hmm. I had a BA in um, uh, English literature, a minor in French. I didn't have theater in my BA. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, the English, the English came in handy, right? <laughs> with the writing and everything later on. That was so interesting that I went towards words instead of instead of mime, mm -hmm. essentially. But there is a, in, in what I do and what Kate did with Jack, there was a lot of physicality. And mm -hmm. what my current project is, it's a musical comedy. And I know, I know what makes people laugh most of the time. Mm -hmm. so I, but it's very physical. I'm, and unfortunately, in Zoom time, it, it <laughs> can't play. It can't play well. You've got mm -hmm. to see it. You've got to you got to see the interactions and right. You got to like feel the wind, right, from the from the players. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so just another thing that just popped up from what you're saying. I'm I'm curious. Uh, there must be some relationship, but maybe it's nothing official. But between mime and clowning, it seems like there's a connection. Is there anything per se? Yes, because great clowns are, are very good mimes. Because mm -hmm. because as you know from from music. It is not, the words, the words are very, very important. I go by words all the time, but it is the unspoken that mm -hmm. really goes right to the heart, whether it's music or mime. Mm -hmm. it, it, just, it just supersedes all the cerebral connections. Right, right. <laughs> right, and I think it, it catches, off, catches us off guard that we can be moved without words, right? Like it almost surprises us like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and and the history of mime does it come from France or is it just happens to be popular no, in France? It, it, um, there were four great mimes in the 1930s. Etienne de Foux was one of them in Paris. Um, Jean Paul, was it Jean Paul Sartre? I doubt it. He's a playwright. Anyway, the three others, and it probably came from Italy, because okay. Italy, uh, that's where um, Commedia dell'arte came from. And although it was not nonverbal, there was, again, there was a lot of physicality, a lot mm -hmm. of shown, shown, not spoken. Right, okay. Hmm. All right, cool. So uh, um, that pretty much sums our second, my second question up, which is, can you tell us about theater, mime, and clowning? Um, so I must admit, oh yeah, okay, then I go into, uh, oh no, you know, you know, this is relevant. So I must admit, I was struck to find out when I first met you that you were a clown, or I don't know if you were still a clown at that time. And I didn't know you could be a clown and have a career. I didn't just didn't never cross my mind. So outside of the circus, you know. Um, so uh, can you live, give us a little bit of an inside perspective? What was it like to be a, a working clown or also to, to juggle life and being a mother and all that? Yeah, I first I was a working clown. I did not get a contract from from uh, um, Ringling, but one of the another person, another clown, very talented, got a contract from a smaller circus, Circus Bartok, which had been it had been around so long that Doc Bartok, the grandfather of the troupe, had uh, had a medicine show. So that must have been like 1910 or 1920. Wow, wow. Um, and uh, so Howie Buton, who is still a clown and still working in Paris. Um, and I, I really should connect to him, but I don't have the time. Um, Howie said um, that, that um, the, the um, daughter of the, um, the granddaughter of, of Doc, um, she was really operating the show at this time. Her name was Bunny Bartok. And she had a fairly young child, a preteen also, David. Uh, he said, go try out for Bartok. There's a woman running the show. Because women didn't do clowns. Women didn't do circus clowns at all, unless you were married to a clown. And uh, at Ringling, in my training, Danny Chapman was a lovely clown. Uh, he was married to a showgirl. He kept trying to convince me to be a showgirl. I had no <laughs> inclination whatsoever to be a show girl. And I don't think I could have done it. But in any case, um, I sort of mm. did it my way. <laughs> and um, so I tried out for Bunny. She loved me. And I was off, off with Circus Bartok. And the only reason I came back is because my father became very ill. So yeah. I came back to Brooklyn. And uh, we lost him eventually. Uh, so um, the difficulty, the impetus to continue clowning. Now, I started to say there were different kinds of clowns. Yes, there are categories, but there are also something else. There's some, some people are what I call vrai, true. That's a French word meaning true. Vrai clowns, vrai musicians, vrai um, composers, vrai sculptors. They're also, I mean, a person who pretty much has to do it. It's born mm. in them, it's born mm. in them. Okay, and I'm one of those. Uh, I didn't know that for a long time, but I, I do know that. I, I personally, um, I personally look very um, sort of scholastic, teacherish, <laughs> but there's this other part of me, you know? And also I make mistakes that only clowns would make. <laughs> you know, just when you guys think you got it right. <laughs> You're upside down. <laughs> okay, that's funny. Anyway, that's a personal thing, but um, uh, but um, I, I think that my my desire to keep clowning led me into um, looking for jobs. When I came back from Ringley, I went to Steeplechase Park in Coney Island. When I came back from Florida from from training, uh, training, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, now. <laughs> The whole of, of uh, Coney Island was very degraded by that time, but it was a kind man named uh, Norman Kaufman who ran one of the concessions, one of the major concessions, Steeplechase Park actually was his, and wow. he hired me. 
And by then I had adopted a little dog. So my doggy and I went clowning to Coney Island every weekend. And wow. then, um, I, you know, at that times have changed. Clowns are not as popular as they were in the 1970s, 80s, and mm -hmm. 90s. But I went to um, malls and I, I remember the Roosevelt Field Mall very well because Frida Stangler ran the shows there. Malls had shows. And I said, well, you know, I'm a clown. I could put a show together for you. I can put, um, you know, uh, I could present something to kids who are shopping and their parents and it'll be more fun. They'll be more relaxed. They're going to have a better time. Yes, she said, go ahead. <laughs> so I worked at a lot of malls. Um, then my cousin worked for, I think, I think they, um, it's a defunct organization. Uh, the National Jewish Welfare Board, they sent out lecturers to uh, synagogues and centers in various things. They could send out musicians, they could send out people who were knowledgeable in one subject or another, and they put me on as their clown. So then I had to develop a show, mm -hmm. uh, and I did. It was called I'll Be the Circus. Um, it was mime. It was 80% mime. I had a lovely, lovely... Um, uh, two, two, two gentlemen, com a composer and a lyricist. I didn't write at that time. Mm -hmm. So um, they composed a song called I'll Be the Circus. I, I have a, a videotape of it. Uh, I don't know how you play that nowadays. <laughs> but, I, I could help you with that. I could help you with that if you want to get that online one day. Not. Just just so, you, just so you know. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Um, and um, it was about a little clown who um, wanted to go to the circus and she missed the train. So mm. she said, I'll be the circus. So <laughs> in mime, I did, um, I did uh, magic. I did tightrope walking. I did animal train, animal, whatever you call it, not training, but you know, working with a vicious tiger in mime, all in mime. Wow. Um, <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. You know, I was pretty young then, I could do these things. So um, I played in a lot of places. So there's this one show, like you had like a beginning, middle, end, it was kind of consistent. You did it the same way. Was, was there a lot of room for yeah. uh, improvising in between? Well, what it is, I used, I co-opted the Bee Gees score. I used the Bee Gees mm -hmm. for um, Saturday, what was it called, Live something? You, you would know the Bee Gees' most famous album. Staying Alive? Staying Alive, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember doing the tightrope with that, Staying Alive. That was so much fun. Um, <laughs> And uh, then I had my song, uh, I'll Be the Circus. But then I developed three other shows for um, malls and for children's uh, parties and all sorts of things. Then I ran my own party place for two years on Nostrand Avenue. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, on sun Sundays only, I think. Uh, there was a dance studio called Stardust that didn't have a program on Nostrand and M or N, something like that. Um, mm. So I rented it. And sometimes I had two parties at once because I could, I could, friends of mine made me a wonderful stand up thing with these all animals, giraffes and lions and tigers. Oh my. So I separated them. At one party, I would be clowning, at another party, I'd be serving pizza. But, <laughs> but I was always in face. That's wow. what clowns are called in face when you're in makeup. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, wow. Yeah, I did that. And then um, Miss Molly from, there was a popular TV show at the time. I don't know how she knew about me, but she did. And she had me on as a guest several times. Um, oh, really? On TV? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, I don't have a record of that. I don't know. Uh, uh, Miss Molly is what the show's called? No, it wasn't called. She was the person it was who did the whole show, but it wasn't called that. I don't remember the name of the show. Itself. Oh, wow. But if, you, I, if I looked up Miss Molly, I probably could get the information. Yeah, I'd definitely be curious. You never know. It could be something online floating around, which would be fun. Yeah. yeah. And then by then my son was born and uh, he was in school. He was like four or five years old. I went to, I had a, one of my shows, birthday party shows, was going in as a person, as a mother, as a woman, as a teacher. And I became a clown in front of the children. I put my makeup on in front of them. And I, I like that because it, it let me talk about the history of clowning, but it also took away the fear that a lot of kids might have had of clowns. Mm. 
So, yeah, that, that is that. There is that aspect to it, right? Some kids oh, or adults even <laughs> are afraid of clowns. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes there's reason for that, but most right. of the time not. Most mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember I have a picture from my, uh, I guess it's my uh, fifth birthday. I think mm -hmm. so. Uh, it could be six. I think it's fifth. Uh, I was living on, um, what do you call it? East 19th Street in Sheepshead Bay. And there was a, there's a clown in the picture. And uh, I don't know if you did. I don't know if, I don't think it's you. It doesn't really look like you, but uh, but it could have been, right? You, you were in the, in the neighborhood, I think. Um, I did, but when you were five years old, I was Hannibal, the lady clown. Yeah. Uh, for children's parties, I dressed in gingham. My costumes were made by fabulous people. Uh, my mother, for one, but also uh, when I was living in the East Village, right down the street, East 7th Street. I mean, who who would have thought that you could have, these kind of coincidences just keep happening? Mm -hmm. um, they made clown shoes which are extraordinary or they're very big. And I mean, they, they have to fit you inside, but they have to look quite large on the outside. Oh, oh no, my brother. <laughs> okay. All right. I told him we'd be doing this interview, but I guess he forgot. Um, okay. Um, anyway. Um, so my mother, my mother chimed in with a comment. She said, uh, romper room. Do you remember? Yes. Or was that yes. the show? The room. Yes. That was a show you were on. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. That, that makes sense because that would that would be appropriate for what you were doing right as a clown right, right. wow <laughs> i i did it two or three times i think she was very she was fun <laughs> miss, wow. <laughs> miss molly and romper cool thank you um yes thanks mom uh so can you describe i think you did already but if there's anything you left out can you describe your relationship with music Yes, so I took singing lessons and um, all the time before I left New York. And then um, I had a harsh lesson. When I came back to New York, uh, they were having um, tryouts for replacements of Fiddler on the Roof. And I had not been on a stage and I hadn't had a singing lesson in three years. And I went to try out because I'm the right, I was the right type. Um, and I, but I had never been on a Broadway stage. I'd, I'd never auditioned for Broadway. So I was very intimidated. I'd just been back in the country for a little bit. And I tried to sing. And Hal Prince, who was the producer, and I think also the director, said to me, dear, dear, if you can't start with the music, how can I hire you? So I didn't get hired. But his casting director remembered me. And she had me come as a clown to her birthday party, uh, to her child's birthday party. So, uh, you know, things and things just move along. Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes you need those. At least he was uh, compassionate about it, right? Um, yeah. Sometimes you need those sort of rude awakenings. You know, sometimes we don't know aspects about ourselves that but you were the you were brave, you know. You went for that audition, even though you felt nervous about it, you know. Yeah, I, I I'll go. I'll I'll, you know, the saying "Look before you leap." That does mm -hmm. not apply to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an Aries, also. But no, I'm. Uh, but back to music. So I always, always, uh, had music associated with what I did, if it was coming from me, and not you know coming from another author or somebody else. Um, and, um, I tried to take, I, I took lyric writing courses and I tried to take music theory at Kingsborough and the teacher was so nice. She had me, she met me after class. She tried to, it's very mathematical as you know, John, and mm -hmm. it was not going to happen. <laughs> so <laughs> I knew I had to work with the composers. I, but, but by then I had been writing poetry and I, I could, I thought, transition from poetry to lyrics which is not so easy it's different it's different it's different, it's different. and I, I noticed i've you know i've seen the way you write lyrics and i i do i can see the poetry component which uh, i would run into um you know as a lyricist because I, I i guess i'm a lyricist first poet poet second maybe mm -hmm. so i would just see that happen um 
and you know it's always fun to find a, a workaround to that but they are so similar but yet you know different you have to use them if you're a lyricist you have to use uh poetry carefully my musical director who's also uh my dramaturg and let's define that for people a dramaturg is basically a play doctor a dramaturg helps the author of a, of a musical comedy or or play very often um get to a structure get to things about the book the script that uh the author was unaware of or didn't do quite properly they come up with ideas and, and good stuff really wonderful things mm -hmm. i'm lucky because my my uh, musical director is also my dramaturg he's good at both so um and he he would say at the beginning oh she's more of a poet than a lyricist but john this week or two weeks ago i'm writing and can i just tell everybody what it is it's an 11 o'clock number can i define that sure oh, okay 11 o'clock number in a musical comedy or a musical uh, is a pretty standard thing to have and it comes just before the end it's not the closing song it's probably the second or third to last and it is when the protagonist um, and there only should be one main protagonist. Um, there should be a, a tree, and the protagonist is the trunk, and everything is, is the branches. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and um, it signals either an intention or a decision or a reversal. It's where emotionally the prot protagonist just comes to terms, to grips with the whole path that she or he has been taking. Mm -hmm. and changes somehow it could be a catharsis maybe not but it could be um it took me actually months and months and months to come up with the 11 o'clock number for the project i'm on now oh, no. jack was much easier <laughs> jack was so much easier huh. um and um and uh so um i don't know why i started to talk about the 11 o'clock number oh yeah because in the middle of the 11 o'clock number my musical director says, we should have a rhapsody. Oh no, what are you talking about? What do you mean a rhapsody? Um, and what he defined in the musical comedy terms as something um, more spiritual, more poetic, more creative, um, a, a whole different melody, a whole different feeling, a whole different ambiance. Uh, to that portion to those that verse or those verses so i said okay and uh, so i wrote a rhapsody uh, it's, it's just one long verse but it's good i had it, i ran it by my reader who i love and she mm -hmm. and um if she loves something it's probably okay, it's probably okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah rhapsody I, I never never quite got that word when i first heard the word rhapsody um of course, I'm no surprise it was Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, in like 92 or something. So before that, I had already heard about the word rap, you know, and because ah. I was 11 and, you know, rap was kind of this popular, fairly new thing at the time on MTV and stuff. So then I heard Bohemian Rhapsody and I was kind of uh, dissatisfied. I'm like, you know, because I, I was just incongruent. You know, I know what rap is. Rhapsody was just totally different. This point, and I didn't know, really know what Bohemian meant. So now, of course, I appreciate that song on a whole different level. But and but then later I heard Rhapsody in Blue, right, Gershwin. Um, yeah. But I do, still don't. I couldn't tell you. You know, after you described it, I wouldn't have been able to to tell you what a Rhapsody was. So it's kind of interesting, you know, to learn about that. Well, I think. Um it might have a much broader meaning than than what was said to me by by Stephen Stephen Borsak, my musical director, because he's narrowing it down mm -hmm. to what was needed in that song. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, but still pr pretty interesting that now makes me curious, you know, what is a rhapsody? I mean, in, in more to, to kind of own it, you know, to really know what it is. Yeah, I'm sure you 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 should find out because there's I recently heard Rhapsody in Blue in its shortened version um, but it was 
oh, it just blew me away. It just really, <laughs> really great. So. And yeah, Rhapsody. Interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, as you know, uh, I'm a strong believer in the power of music. Uh, can you share from your experience how music has enriched enriched your experience of life? Like maybe when you were down, how it brought you up, or just in general, like compared to if, if it wasn't a, didn't play a role in your life, how, how different it would be, you know, something to that effect. Oh, it has been very important to me, even as a child, because things were happening that were I didn't understand and were sad, and I would I would cry to Grieg's piano concerto mm -hmm. <laughs> as, a, as a very young kid, um, and also um, now um, I have a wonderful partner, you know, Alan, but mm -hmm. sometimes he's not here. You know, in fact, he's not here right now. He's coming home tonight, um, and. Um, I, I use music all day long. The first thing that I do in the morning is um, classical music, QXR usually, but not always. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and by the way, uh, uh, another plug, I, I am on um, uh, www.musicaltheaterradio.com. And this okay. is run by John Paul Ivanich. And, mm -hmm. and, it's, and I probably pronounced John Paul's name wrong, but he does a fantastic job. He, first of all, he has like uh, something called a sample platter where he shows CD covers from like 150 new musicals. But he also plays all day long music from recognized Broadway hits. And, oh, there's nothing like listening to that. You know, there's several stations where you get, you know, Broadway. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I listen to that a lot because it teaches me, which is very important, but it's very uplifting. I mean, writing is isolating. We've all now been isolated mm -hmm. for over a year, right? Mm -hmm. and you're writing. And my composer is in Norway. <laughs> and so, and he's also had certain life experiences in this last year, which made, made it not a good time to work with him, which he's wonderful and I love him. That's Tor Ingar Jakobsen. He's a he's great. I was in touch with him earlier today um, for my eleven o'clock number, which he's ready for, which is great. Um, and um, I I just it, it, you use the word uplifting. There is nothing like it. Now I'm show music, but there's lots of other kinds of music. There's lots of from the bluegrass score of Jack to uh, and, and many, many, many blue, bluegrass um, sort of concerts by people. Um, and uh, I just, I have music on, uh, I would say 90% of the time. Wow. I, just, I just have it on, it's just mm -hmm. with me. It's just with me. I can't right. imagine how, how very um, disconnected to the world I would feel if I didn't have music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that we have. And can you imagine living in an era before radio, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's very tough, actually. I guess a lot more whistling, whistling while you work in that era. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. Cool, yeah. So uh, from your perspective, what are some of the wonderful benefits of music? You address some of them, but just in general, for for the world at large, for, for people of all stripes and types, what you are some what? things benefit? You, know what? you don't have to sit still while music's playing. You can get mm -hmm. up. You can dance. Nobody's yeah. watching. <laughs> right. I mean, it's fun to move your body to music for one, for one thing. Um, and just to, um, to have it either as background music or to actually listen to it. I was never a concert goer. You know, if anything, I would like a small club. And I, mm -hmm. I did visit several of them. One wonderful one on West 52nd Street with a horseshoe be, uh, 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 bar where Marion McCartland played and Bill Evans played. Um, mm -hmm. And that was that was wonderful. But um, I, I, I think it's, um, I'm trying to find a metaphor that describes what music does for you. And the way I, the way I would just say is just try, just put put something on, put something on the radio, put the CD on, put Spotify on, put Pandora on, 
put please www.musicaltheaterradio.com <laughs> on that's john paul's baby and um you'll hear a lot of interesting th- really interesting things wonderful things um mm-hmm. there you know in the in this particular time that we live in which is so tough for so many people um so, you know and i'm writing a musical comedy and sometimes i say to myself why am i writing a musical comedy why aren't I, why aren't i addressing heavy social issues well i can't do that i don't know how to do that it's not me <laughs> <laughs> and so, so uh but music can do it music can can address you when you're very down music can address you when you're up music can address you when you're in between uh, music mm-hmm. can be shared music can be shared uh, sometimes I buy tickets online. There's another fellow, um, Nick, and I forget his last name, but he, he will do jazz concerts. And now I've discovered Jane Monheit, who I like a lot. Um, she, she did two Broadway show concerts. So jazz, jazz singing. Um, so you buy a ticket uh, online and you listen to a concert. It's a, it's a really wonderful thing. Cool. Yeah, uh, just and just to uh, feedback on one of your comments that um, you're writing a comedy and there's maybe a lot of trouble in the world as we we perceive it with with all the media that we get and everything. But uh, I would definitely say that um, writing a comedy might be one of the best ways to bring light to uh, to the world, especially your 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 comedy under her hat actually does address some social issues, not on the heaviest level, but it, it, it does, it definitely um, addresses the issue of like uh, tolerance and learning to live together and un- understand one another, which is, is essentially what the, the many of our social issues are dealing with anyway, but you do it in a very lighthearted way. Um, there's a co- comedian I, I enjoyed, I enjoy from time to time. Uh, he looks a little bit like me, if you ever see him, his name is JP Sears. Uh, he's got this long red hair and a beard and he's, he's, you know, he's a little controversial. Not everyone likes him, but he's quite funny. And he just talks about all the stuff that you hear in the news, but from this very humorous angle. And uh, somehow you feel like you're getting more truth from him than you are from, from any of the news medias. Anyway, uh, it's interesting how comedy can really cut through uh, the BS sometimes because you, when you laugh that, that, that kind of brings forth, a certain element of truth or, or your humanity, you know. It does, and it's very healing, also. Mm-hmm. Laughter is a pre- is a prescription, almost, you know. Yeah. Much better than what pharmaceuticals do. Um, yes. I, I, I'll add to that that um, in Native American tribes, not all of them, I'm sure. I don't really know, but certainly in the Southwest, the Hopi, um, Pueblo Indians, the um, doctor, the witch doctor, was also a comedian and clown. Um, mm-hmm. um, and I, I forget his name right now, and it will always be a male. Um, and so the job was to lighten up, <laughs> to lighten people up, to help mm-hmm. them medically and to lighten people up. So yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I, I do um, question myself about the validity of continuing to work on a project for a long time. Um, but I do think that's what the world needs. The world needs that. You mm-hmm. need that as much as, as Prokofiev or Tchaikovsky. You need all that. So. Yeah. And it, it just, just reminds me of something, and I'm not saying it's the same thing, but just to, to kind of put a different spin on like us working, and any individual, any creator, working on a project like for a very long time, right? Uh, there's this wonderful short film. I, sorry, I don't know the name of it. If I could think of it, I'll put it in the show notes. But it's about this man in South America, <clears throat> and he's building an airplane. And he lives in like a, a favela. I don't know if it's Brazil or Argentina or something. And he lives in a very poor town, and he doesn't have much materials. But whatever scraps he can get from from the uh, the from the garbage and from wherever he manages to get things, he pieces them together and he's building a plane. Mm-hmm. And all the children, especially the children are much more kinder, but the adults kind of laughing at him like, you're never gonna build this plane. But, and you, you look at the plane he's building and you think to yourself, 
oh, this must be some weird delusion, but he does, doesn't stop. And he just, it's his passion, his love, and he just keeps on working on it. And whatever it is that the plane symbolizes to him, it's worth it because it, it bring, it may, he's a lighthearted, happy person working on his plane, even if it'll never fly, even if it's made of garbage bits here. And it is pretty fascinating. I, 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 I think I cried while watching that because of the pure heart of that, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'd like to know that. I'd like to, if you remember the name, and I'd like to get it. Also, could you put the name of the comedian in a text or something? That you yeah, know? I'll put him in, in the show notes as well. And then you could just scan as you look at the show, uh, whatever we talked about. Yeah. J.P. Sears. <laughs> He's a little bit... Um, you know, not for everyone, but I got a kick out of him. He could be harsh, and uh, but you know, sometimes I feel like I need that. Um, yeah. So, um, for those who may not know, uh, you and I, Hannah and I, have collaborated on a family musical today together called Jack, and later known as Jack and the Chocolate Milk Cow. So, what was, uh, if you didn't say it directly, what was your initial inspiration to dive in and write a musical? What made you say, because you were getting into the Jack story, you, you thought you were fascinated by it. Why'd you say, I'm going to actually write a musical? What was that? Well, I had music in my background. I, more, there were more negatives that got me into it because I wasn't doing anything creative. And I just was a very uneasy about that. Um, so um, I had the music, I had the poetry. I had the fairy tale that meant something to me, and uh, I just went with it. I just said, "Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it." <laughs> you know, once I wrote the first song, "My Son Jack," quackity quack, clackity quack, <laughs> mm -hmm. tries to please everyone. Everyone, you know. I, <laughs> once I once I launched it, it was a lot of fun. It was it was it was worth staying up very very late, you know, and uh, and doing it. And, and so, you know, there wasn't a specific path, uh, um, it was a specific path, sorry. It mm -hmm. wasn't like a decision. I don't think it was a decision. I think I had all the elements, had all the elements. That, that was very interesting to me also that because I had done so many different things in life, um, they came together to write, to write musicals. <laughs> I should have built buildings or something, whatever. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Under a Hat came about from that uh, workshop at uh, Young Playwrights. Can I tell that story? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. yeah, fun story. It's like, so we, I went to Paul's, you know, workshop, a weekend workshop at, at Young Playwrights. And I was in an acting improvisation on, on Saturday, a long acting improvisation. It was, it was good, but I was knocked out from it. And uh, they, uh, at the end, the instructors gave us a sheet of paper and they said, and a pencil, and they said, do this, write A, skip a line, write B, skip a line, write A, skip a line, write B, all the way to the end of the paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then they said, here is your prompt that you write at the top of the paper. Hey, did you see that? And I was really tired. And mm -hmm. the first thing that came in my head was this hat. So I wrote, hey, did you see that hat? And, and uh, the homework from Saturday to Sunday was to write a scene between two people who are talking about whatever the prompt was. So I took it home and I did my homework and I brought, and I brought it back. I, I picked two characters who were at the Halloween parade in New York, which is mm -hmm. spectacular in terms of, of uh, costumes and headgear. <laughs> so I, uh, I read it to the class. We all read our things, and they loved it. So you know, that's how you get hooked, when somebody really likes what you're doing. <laughs> right, they give you some juice, right? Yeah, yeah. So, mm, wow, I didn't know that. And, and what, what year was that about? I would say about 90, because I think no, no, no. It was, I think, later than that because it was. I retired in two thousand and three. It must have been early two thousands. 
because by 2011, I had a working script mm -hmm. for, uh, under her hat. It's so, a heck of a lot, but I had I had a script. So I songs. Because uh, I don't remember really hearing about Under Her Hat in the in the early days of Jack. Was it was it around at that time? When I'm not quite. No. So it was, yeah, at least mid two thousands. Then I guess probably right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Jack, I knew Jack played in two thousand and four. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true, and I didn't. I hadn't started Under Her Hat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I so I, if it played in two thousand four spring, I met uh, if February March I think it was. I imagine we started summer 2003 or something like that, at least, if not earlier. Yeah. Probably summer around there. That was pretty then, fast, right? Right. And then, yeah, well, Jack came along because, because you know, what, what's the structure of Jack? Here's a kid that's very impractical. His mother thinks he can't do a thing and the family is starving. Okay. Mm -hmm. And he has his friend, the cow. Well, he, she can't be his friend. They need the milk. They need something that is productive. So he has immediately an obstacle. He has that he has to sell his friend. Okay. And then, you know, then there's this giant who killed his father. So you have a revenge kind of thing going also. And he's also much smarter than he looks. Mm -hmm. He's he, he could be a clown. <laughs> He he's he doesn't have the kind of smarts that most people think are acceptable, but he's canny. So he, the structure of Jack is he climbs up that beanstalk three different times, and how am I going to get the audience to um, be curious enough to stick with him? Mm -hmm. the same thing is repetitive action. Mm -hmm. So I had to come up with reasons and stuff. That would make the audience say, "What is he going to do next? How mm -hmm. is he going to ha handle this?" Okay, right, so, right. so it's it's three hundred years old at least. It's fairy tale, so you know it works. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and it was pretty well there for you the structure. So that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that helped it come together. For, right, as opposed to under her hat, which you're kind of just making up from it's zero. An it's an original, yeah. new, original musical. I would recommend that nobody in their right mind ever do that. And mm. uh, unless you feel you must. <laughs> and and um, it's um, much, much more of a struggle, but it's also very satisfying if you get something right. Mm -hmm. get something right. Yeah, and we'll put links to uh, both whatever materials online for Jack, as well as under her hat in the show notes if people oh, want to see what, what you've Much done with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, your second musical venture under her hat? Like, what's the story about? Or Sure. Well, I um, I tend to be a person who's on a, on a soapbox about social issues uh, when I can be. Um, and I live in a neighborhood that um, is um, pretty heavily um, Asian American. And I did not like what I saw happening to my Asian American neighbors when white folks, Caucasian folks pass by and things like that. And I, I, I felt the bigotry and I it made me not comfortable. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm Jewish by the way. Uh, so I wanted to write something that incorporated that um, and yet was fun. Um, and so I took the two different cultures, Jewish American and Chinese American. And I made the Jewish American protagonist, the female, and the Chinese American um, kind of second lead, um, Chinese American. Um, and it was a, it's, it's been such an interesting ride because I've had many, many readings, and I like to be always authentic. Now, I can't always find a Chinese American um, uh, male lead, and I can't always find a, a grandfather or a um, mother uh, that are Asian American, oh, well, that are Chinese American, but I can find Filipino, I can find Japanese. I, I've had a lot of different Asian uh, nationality people read with me um, mm -hmm. and my actors. Uh, Jewish American is okay. I, I'm pretty well set with that. Although there is one wonderful comedian, she's so marvelous. She played the mother of the Jewish American girl 
but she has a Boston accent and nobody would ever believe that she was Jewish. So <laughs> I can't do that. But um, in any case, um, my Asian American cast members kept telling me in subtle ways sometimes that I wasn't playing fair, that yes, I knew the Jewish background, all right, but I did not know the Chinese American background and I wasn't presenting it authentically or with validity. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn. In fact, I, I was on the phone the other day and I'll be calling her back this week, a, a retired teacher from Murrow who's um, Chinese American. Um, unfortunately for me, she's a Mandarin speaker where I, I really need Cantonese. <laughs> but but I, there are parts where I need Mandarin, a little bit of Mandarin also. So um, I, I needed to level that playing field. I needed to get background. And so that was, that was the first priority in terms of social action. And, I, and then times have changed. I could not make it out there, out there, even though there's, of course, and I don't like to say it, but there's Asian hate nowadays. There's much worse than, than, than well, maybe not much worse, but it's certainly less subtle than what was happening 10 years ago. Anyway, um, I had to sort of keep it there and yet tone it down because youngsters don't care. Oh, do they, John? Mm -hmm. Do you go around saying, I'm this and she's that? You don't do that in your family. So uh, obviously things are much more accepted. Um, on some levels, but there are lots of places where things are not accepted. So that's why mm -hmm. I've always said, if I get under hat produced, boy, I'd like it to go regional. I'd like it to go to those places. It doesn't have to be in New York. New York knows this message already. Mm -hmm. but lots of places in the country don't. Um, so that would be a nice thing. Anyway, um, the thing about Cheryl, Cheryl Roth, is that she's an obsessive hat creator. And she's in school at FST, and as I always say, if SST, because I don't want to be sued by FIT. <laughs> um, um, and um, she's not grad school. She's only like 2021 20, at the beginning of this show. Um, he's there too, but she doesn't know it. They don't know each other. He's a merchandising ex uh, accessories major with a minor in millinery. He loves hats. And she's a millinery designer um, um, major. Um, and so they have a meet cute at, at, at the locker room and Wal Wallman's skating rink. Uh, so nobody has to build a skating rink for me. <laughs> we just need a little two boxes. Um, anyway, they meet, they're very attracted to each other. They fall in love. They marry, they found, um, a company called Sachet Hats Incorporated, but hats are never a good sale. It's a little crazy to be a hat person, right? Um, and so um, there's lots of ups and downs. I can't go into them. Mm -hmm. um, but the families are involved. Um, her mother and her, her grandmother, who's Yiddish um, appellation is Bubby, and his mother and his grandfather on the maternal side, whose appellation is Gungung. And um, lots, lots of stuff. Uh, also, it should be it must be said, that Cheryl is the trunk, and I said everything's the branches that comes off that. Mm -hmm. One of the branches is the mothers have boyfriends. And uh, one of them is a fast food Mexican uh, fella here in New York, fast food uh, entrepreneurial owner of a fast food place. And one of them is a shirt exporter who lives in Hong Kong and is the boyfriend, supposedly, of, of Justin's mother. And what happens is because the, the marriage is in such danger of falling apart that they, they, uh, the whole Chinese arm of the family, including Howie, come to New York and the two fellows fall in love with each other. So that's, <laughs> that's part of the mix also. I wanted to do, I wanted to get LGBTQ in there. Um, mm -hmm. I think I did it very, I think I've done it very successfully. It's not hitting anybody to the face in the, in the sense that we're flag waving here. It's just part of life. It's part of the life of these characters. Mm -hmm. um, so I like that. And I hate to say it, but there is a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> Hope I didn't give it away.
So, but uh, yeah, Cheryl realizes what she is, what she is in the 11 o'clock number. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, so yeah, there's some new stuff there that I hadn't known about because I, you know, I have some familiarity with this show and uh, yeah, some new stuff uh, with the, um, the two guys falling in love I didn't know about in the 11th hour song I don't think I knew about. So cool, I'm glad to see it's developing and yeah. with you, it, it's with, with your uh, evolution as a human being too, right? Which is- Oh, very much so. I mean, it's taught me so much yeah a pretty pretty interesting way to learn certain lessons is that you your determination to write this this kind of stubborn determination to write like you said something that no one in their right mind would do has led you down this unique journey to to grow as a human being as well as create a very unique piece of art that may you know has already influenced all the people that you've uh involved in in doing stage readings and stuff so people have been influenced by your work on that level and whatever's online people can see and who knows where it's going to go from here and with your composer all the work that that's generated between the two of you and in his world so yeah you're making an impact and uh thank you i think i think it's worth it i just mm -hmm. think it's worth it yeah i mean well imagine you didn't do it Oh, I, why, you know, why not? That. Wouldn't that yeah, wouldn't that stink if there was just that that part of Hannah didn't exist? You know, I no know benefit. Hannah, you know, there's certain, only a certain amount of gardening you could do when you have pots. <laughs> you know, I'm not right. a plumber. <laughs> so. Right? Yeah, yeah. So kudos, kudos to you for keeping those uh, those fires burning. Thank you, thank you. I I just think it's very important. Um, anybody everybody who has one iota of creativity in them should i hope nourish it nourish it mm -hmm. um, i i should have brought my uh, uh copy of that 11 o'clock number because cheryl says you know she doesn't want to let go of her dream she's pregnant she's going to have a baby he doesn't know it mm -hmm. um and he insults her. He said, well, if we ever had a baby, you would turn the baby over to your mother and your grandmother, and you just keep making hats because that's all you care about. And she's <laughs> terribly insulted. Um, and so part of the 11 o'clock number is I'm not going to, I'm going to raise, it's, well, that's not the title anymore, but it, it opens with the line, I'm going to raise my kid. Mm -hmm. But she also goes into how um, she's not going to let go of the thing that identifies her, the thing that is so strongly built in her. Mm -hmm. um, and then she talks in, a, um, I think, um, you know, classic A, A, B, A um, verse pattern uh, mm -hmm. in the, um, uh, uh, songs is that, um, but I think the B section is, doesn't everybody have a dream? Mm -hmm. Doesn't everybody scheme to keep that dream alive all their lives? You know, so, I mean, it's, I think that's pretty universal. I think we do. I think mm -hmm. you are fulfilling your dream, John. I am in my way fulfilling my dream. Um, I see that Yoko is fulfilling her dream. I see that my partner, Alan, is fulfilling his dream. And my brother is in his way. And everybody has something that they and it could be very different from one thing to another mm -hmm. um, but but it's a cre it's a creativity that i don't think i mean you really have to squash it <laughs> to, to, and not let it loosen you even if you're just making embroidery not just actually if you're making embroideries why not mm -hmm. so oh yeah everything everything as long as you find it as long as you find it and and let it let it run, run with it. It doesn't have to be your career. We all have to make money. We all have to mm -hmm. support our households, uh, our children, or whatever, you know, but um, you need to let it run, let it loose, and see where it takes you a little bit. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, the Wayne, Wayne Dyer's quote, uh, Wayne Dyer, the, the writer and he, yeah. uh, inspirational guy. He said, don't die with your music still in you. Say that again. Don't die with your music still in you. Still in you. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Right. And uh, I, I, even though I, I certainly felt like I've 
released a lot of music and all that. When I heard that message, it was at a time when I had been not stagnant, but I just wasn't had no active direction. I just wasn't sure I was going creatively. Uh, this was maybe 10 years ago. And, and I was like, ah, it's still, it had a little bit of a stink for me. Like there's still more for me to do. And I had to figure out what that was, but, um, yeah, I like that phrase. Uh, so, um, can you, what aspects of your life philosophy help you to recover from setbacks? I mean, here you are, you're still plugging along and, uh, so obviously there must've been a couple of bumps in the road. What, what aspects of your life, life philosophy help you to recover from setbacks and have a positive outlook? Um, I do cling to my writing. I do cling to it, really cling strongly. Um, and I have, a, a, I've done things and had things done to me or at me over and over, including as you get older, you have medical things, or even when you're younger, you have medical things. Um, and um, one of my mantras is start with now. Now, this mm -hmm. moment, start with now. You, you, you can, one can pray over past, past things. You know, I just invited you to the Jewish ceremony of Tashlit where you get mm -hmm. rid of your um, sins of the year by throwing bird seed or, or uh, sesame seeds or, or um, some sort of um, nut into, into water a little bit, but nothing that would harm the water. Um, mm -hmm. And I, uh, I need that kind of coaching. I need to say, start with now. Mm -hmm. That you, you give the past it's due. You think about it, you let it make you hopefully a better person. Um, you let it guide you into better journeys, but start with now. And um, mm -hmm. that, that's been very important for me. Also, I, um, although I uh, personally can uh, uh, get sick because of treatments I had many years ago that were necessary, I get sick easily, but I also seem to be very resilient. I recover quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for that. I'm really grateful for that. So um, I, th I, I also am a thoughtful person. I think it's, it's, my father used to sit, we used to call it the green chair. There was a green overstuffed chair in our living room, a little apartment. And he would sit there and he would shake his foot and do nothing else. All he was doing was thinking. Mm -hmm. There was no music. There was no, certainly television, nothing. He just sat there thinking. And mm -hmm. I think that's missing a lot from, from nowadays. Yeah. We don't, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. No, no. It's, uh, yeah, it, it sounds like a, a exotic pleasure to hear it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Sounds um, odd. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It, it, you know, I think the, the modern mindset, the first just like attacking thought is like, that's wasting time, right? Of course, we know it's right, not. Right. But that that's the, that's the like uh, knee jerk reaction for me to sit there and just tap my foot for however that long. I mean, I think I, hopefully I'm mature enough to realize that that is effective. But still, there will be that part of me that go go part of me saying, well, there's only so many hours left today. What do you got to do? You know, you know, so but, much uh, to do. there is so much to do, but mm -hmm. most of it can be postponed a day or two. Yeah. Yeah. Or a week or two or a month or two. Right. 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 Yeah. I, I, um, in addition to my uh, chanting, which I do as a Buddhist, as you know, mm -hmm. um, daily, twice daily, uh, I've begun to get into meditation a little more kind of from from the perspective of uh for my physical body because i like to my body never feels great in the morning and um does so I, it does usually does not ne never feels good in the morning almost never okay so i need to stretch and but somehow i felt i've come to this new thing which is kind of of my own which is i do stretching to, while meditating and I just allow myself to do whatever stretch I want. 
no prescribed thing anyone ever told me, just any stretch that feels good. And for as long as I want to. And listening to this kind of these meditation soundtracks uh, or, you know, like guided meditation, it's been doing this really like nice thing for me because it's, it's not entertainment. You know, this is really like uh, thera therapeutic type of healing work that I'm doing. That's just making my body just return to this, this empty sort of like this stillness, uh, re realizing my connection or my, how I'm, my whole body's into like, everything's okay. Like basically that's what I try to set to myself. Everything's okay. No matter how I feel, everything's okay. And then in that, you know, starting to that feeling of wholeness, we're all connected. Everything's okay. Then I go about my day. I eat, I, I chant, but it, it's like, it's really like a non-ego based place. Like I almost feel like I'm rebirthing myself every morning lately. Yeah. It, it's kind of interesting. And like, I'm like half sleeping when I do it too. But I, anyway, I mentioned that as you said, how your father just sat in the chair. That's kind of my sitting in the chair lately. And I do believe that sitting and doing nothing is, uh, if it's intentional. Um, this guy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Spider-Man. <laughs> we did. I know Spider-Man was going to be here tonight. I did not. Did you know, Hannah? No, I am surprised. She's surprised you're here, <laughs> Spider-Man. Yeah, Spider-Man can't hear us because uh, I have headphones on. But um, thank you for joining us, Spidey. Mm -hmm. Um. So, uh, Hannah, can you share up to three inspiring books or films or or theater? Anything that you've lately been inspired by maybe that you'd like to recommend to our listeners? You know, when I saw that question, I, I said, boy, my choices are for me so narrow because it's like uh, The Secret Life of the American Musical by Jack Viertel or The Craft of Lyric, Lyric Writing by Sheila Davis. Um, and I do think if anybody's interested in theater, that um, Mike Nichols, A Life by Mark Harris, which is over a thousand pages, I think, is extremely instructional. It's got a lot of stuff in it, but Mike Nichols was quite a guy. Um, and um, that was good. Uh, I, I couldn't really, um, there've been so many books that have inspired me on the way, but like little pieces of, of the books to pull out. So I couldn't really think of anything you know, mm. spiritually enlightening, um, but well, um, anything, anything that makes you feel good, you know, I mean, it could yeah. be, well, you, you know, know, a I, fantasy movie, you know, I, um, I saw Nomadland recently Hello. and it is such a Hello. story of displacement and, um, I'm in connection with, um, my son's, uh, um, significant other who is a Bosnian refugee from the age of seven years and is now is has been for many years in Norway and Norwegian and he has done two videos one of which was shown I think at the Art Students League on 23rd Street in 2019 just before COVID um, and it's also about displacement he deals with um, the short they're like 30 minutes his name is Damir Av. Let me see if I can produce his last name properly. Av. Whoops. This is a plug again. Avdagic. Damir Avdagic. I don't know. You, you can get a hold of it, but it's part of because it's a whole part of a, a, a Norwegian um, display and forum in a in a um, uh, museum in Oslo, but mm -hmm. also about displacement. And then with the Afghan crisis, it seemed to me with all the huge issues facing us, and I'm not going to mention the name of that state in the South that has made a huge issue for every woman in this country, um, but also displacement, people having to not be where they expected to be, where their ancestors were, where... Um, their life was expected to roll out in a certain way, no matter, you know, what partners they had or what friends they had or what um, careers or jobs they had. But there were expectations which are suddenly totally disrupted. 
Um, so that that was on my mind. And uh, I would certainly recommend Nomadland to everybody. Mm -hmm. Cool. And I remember, thank you. And I remember one time you told me about, I think it was, I think it was you. Uh, yes, must have been uh, Evan Hansen, right? Did you you got some of that? I love that. It's a really well written musical. Um, it's, it's, and also it deals with a boy who never feels as though he has a place. He never feels mm -hmm. that he's really alive and being noticed. So he gets himself into a lot of trouble. But, mm -hmm. but it's so there is a rhapsody in that play. Oh, yeah. I um, I think it's, it's it's a song, a whole song called "Forever," which is so marvelous, so beautiful. I I can say that it has absolutely nothing to do with what I wrote. It's a, a whole different thing, it, and it's, a, it's structured totally differently. But it is so on the mark. Uh, mm -hmm. Dear Evan Hansen, yes, uh, people should see that. People cool. should definitely see that. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what are your plans in the upcoming several months? If you'd like to share anything with our listening audience, well, I'm going to hopefully finish the, uh, the actual piece. Um, I will be working with Damir and, and um, I'm sorry, uh, with Tor, not Damir. He's another <laughs> person um, with Tor and Stephen. Stephen, I wouldn't let anybody in my house for a very long time because of COVID, but now my porch is looking better. And I think I can invite Stephen to come over and we can work face to face. There's nothing like working face to face. Yeah. We would like if we had your studio right away. Mm -hmm. um, and um, oh, by the way, I just wanted to mention uh, I know it's not on, on the subject, but we went back to Jack and we created another, we, we did that twice. We created the Giant Song in your studio and then mm -hmm. we also created uh, the Interactive Song. The, uh, the Chocolate Milk Cow song. Mm -hmm. I, I rented a studio for that, and it's with children. Uh, I rented them. No, 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 I didn't. <laughs> my, my friends had children and grandchildren. They brought them. So it was very uh, delightful. We had a wonderful Jack. Wonderful. Yes. Jack. Yeah. Yeah, which people can see that uh, on the, in, if they follow links to the Jack page, they could check that out. That's a fun video. Yeah, right, because it never, it's in the play, but the play hasn't been produced again. So right. it's not, you don't you don't see this part of the video, play video, it's separate. Mm -hmm. um, and you were playing the guitar. Yeah. Uh, yep. Next time you do that, I'm gonna give you different stage directions. <laughs> but it was good. And, and then, unfortunately, I didn't realize that you and, um, and a wonderful lead should have been interacting more with each other, but you learn, you learn as you go. <laughs> anyway, um, but um, so where were we? Uh, so yeah, your plans in the upcoming several months. Yeah, I've got to finish the. I've got to finish it. Um, I think from what I've seen on um, music musical theater radio that I need to re-record when tour is finished with the music. He wrote a rock song for me, by the way. I wanted it for the wedding night. So mm -hmm. It's really, really, really a rock song. And um, um, I think probably I'll be going into a recording studio. I'm not making some connections to people who have connections to studios and singers. And um, we'll see. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I need to do this if it's <laughs> not going to be produced. But that's where I, that's where I think I need to go. That's interesting. Go. Interesting. I would great. really, I'm sorry. No, great. I would really like to have more readings because what comes off the page is very different from what the author's perception is when she or he is writing on the page. Um, and um, I'm very stymied by not being able to do that right now. Mm -hmm. But it, it ha that has to be done. And these are just table, what are called table readings, just mm -hmm. to hear it among actors um, and to hear the comments also, and just to hear their voices. What, they, what is she doing? What is he doing with that line? Wow, I didn't know that could, that could be funny. Or wow, I didn't know that sound was so angry. Mm -hmm. you, just, you just don't until you hear it. Um, so that's, that's in the future. Cool. Excellent. Yeah.
Thank you. And uh, where can people find you and learn more about you and what you're doing in the world? Or if you don't have a central place to send them, I have some links I'll include in the show notes. Yeah, because uh, I just went to uh, Instagram, which I wasn't succeeding in doing. Uh, I wanted to post that lovely flyer that you did, but it wouldn't stick. <laughs> but I, uh, under Hat Musical, Under Hat Musical or Under Hat Play is on Instagram. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a URL for Facebook as well. That that stopped in about 2012 or 13. And fa it, they used to call it a fan page. I don't think they do it anymore. And it's kind of messy, but it has a lot of material from the early development of the play. And it's a lot of fun because I do a lot of hats also. Um, and um, that you have to go to that specific URL. This I think I think I know where it is. Yeah, yeah. I think I got it. So that that's it. They won't let me back on to post more things. So okay, it's fine. Oh, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. um, and recently, I've I have a, a very nice relationship with a, a young man um, who is very savvy on um, social media. Unfortunately, he's very busy. Also, um, he he is a drag queen and he's developing a, a marvelous character, uh, Marilyn Monroe. That's <laughs> Celabrec. And you could find him on Instagram as well. Um, and um, that that might take part of this, take me over to more ex exposure in social media. He said, mm -hmm. Twitter account for me, I have no idea what to do with it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, you know, these are things I have to learn. Cool, cool. Very exciting. It's, it's always refreshing to hear someone just to, to speak to someone who just continually to challenge challenges new things throughout life, no matter, you know, if people your age may tend not to use Instagram, but you said, Hey, I'll try it, you know, and I don't mean to, to, to date you, but we're not the same generation, you know, and you're not the Instagram generation, generally speaking, but that's okay with you. Right. <laughs> it's not going to stop you, which is great. I'm slower. It takes me more time to absorb something. Sometimes I have to learn a lesson several times before I really get it, but I'm willing. That's great. Yeah. And by the way, the uh, Jack and the Chocolate Milk Cow video is terrific. And everybody was great on that. So, and, and I got what I wanted from it because I wanted the interaction because that song goes um, something like, um, well, do cows fly? And the kids say, no. Mm -hmm. do, do cows ever ask why no so it's a lot it's a lot of fun and you know i'm, I'm really glad we did it mm -hmm. yeah and it exists exists online so people can find it which is yep, yep. cool all right hannah it's been really wonderful we had a good uh what is it two, two and a half yeah no no one and a half hour no no one and a half hour <laughs> <laughs> one and a half hour dialogue and uh yeah i really appreciate your time Thanks for hanging out with me. Thank you for asking me. I'm so pleased. Yeah, I will get the links to you in an email so you can share them as you like or you know do whatever you like with them. And uh, I'll put you know park it on Facebook so it, uh, for, and YouTube so it'll be there as an archive perpetually. Because there are songs from Under a Hat. They're they were recorded in 2013, so they were rehearsal studio songs. But mm -hmm. if people hear them, they'll get the gist. Get yeah, yeah. Them. Yeah, I think I, I, I'll double check, but I think I have that link. It'll be in the show notes. And uh, yeah, people can learn more about your work in the world. Oh, that's very, very kind of you. Thank you so much for asking me. All right, Hannah, have a wonderful night and uh, I'll talk to you before long. Bye-bye. Yeah. Right, take care, thanks.